myself. My name is uh, Professor Chris Apelamian, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies here at Cal, as well as a faculty chair of the Center for Research at, at Social Change. Uh, before we begin, I want to announce our next um, speaker, our next event. I'm going to butcher the name here. Uh, Karamet Ryder? Reader? Writer. Writer, uh, who is an assistant professor of criminology at UC Irvine. And uh, she'll be giving a talk on her recent book, 23-7, Pelican Bay Prison and the Rise of Long-Term Solidarity Confinement. And that talk will be um, uh, November 3rd from 4 to 5.30 p.m. at 2240 Pimon Avenue, Berkeley, California. Um, I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, which is the uh, CRG Social Movement Working Group, as well as the Berkeley Center for Social Media. Well, before we begin, I just want to go over the format. Uh, most of you have been to these talks before. It's usually, um, I ask to everyone to shut off their phones. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and we, uh, we have the speaker go on for about 45 minutes and then we open it up for, uh, for Q&A. Uh, also, before we start, I want to um, just kind of uh, announce that um, the speaker uh, will be selling some books and t-shirts that are outside to support... Um, it's called Swag. Swag, okay. <laughs> to support Swag, uh, which is an amazing organization. Um, so if you're interested in the merchandise, uh, oh, this is this. All right, so that said, um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Julia Chinjare O'Hara, who is Associate Provost and Co-Chair of Ethnic Studies uh, here at Mills College, which is about three blocks away from where I live. Mm -hmm. I always drive by the beautiful campus. Uh, her interests span a number of different social concerns, including activism, women of color, violence against women, women in the prison industrial complex, restorative justice, queer and gender li uh, transgender liberation, race and adoption, and research justice and birth activism. Uh, Professor Paul received her PhD in sociology from the University of Warwick, and she is the author of numerous publications, including uh, Other Kinds of Dreams, Black Women's Organizations and the Politics of Transformation, and Activist Scholarship, Anti-Racism and Feminism and Social Change. Uh, the, title, the title of today's talk is Birth Matters, Black Women and Research Justice as Transformative Practice. So um, join me in welcoming Professor um, Thank you, Chris and Cynthia and everyone who got me here. And it's nice to be over here at Cal. I actually started out my teaching career at uh, UC Berkeley over there in women's studies. And then I found myself in ethnic studies. And then I got swept away to Mills College. And I fell in love and have never come back since. But here I am. <laughs> it's a great school. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk about the work that um, I've been doing in partnership with this incredible organization, Black Women Birthing Justice. Do, 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 do. Um, please do take a moment at the end to pick up some swag. We have these beautiful tote bags and t-shirts, and we also have a book that we put together. Um, it's all ways of supporting grassroots movement work through the scholarly work that we do, right? Um, so I'm excited to have an opportunity to do that. I'm also excited that Linda, who is on the picture there, is also in the audience. So uh, I may at some point just put her up here on, and put her on the spot and say, no, Linda can talk about that part. No. Um, <laughs> she's like, no, that's not going to happen. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about what I'm hoping that we can do today. Um, Research Justice is a framework that I'm really excited about and have been working with for the past five years. So I want to talk a little bit about what that means and how it grew out of Linda to White Smith's work on decolonizing knowledge. Um, so get us on the same page with that. Some of us in the room may already be familiar. Some of us may find it's a new idea. So just talk a little bit about that. Um, I want to talk to you about this Research Justice project that uh, I've been involved with for the last five years with Black Women Birthing Justice, which has been personally deeply transformative and I think hopefully has also done some transformative work in the world. Um, part of what we do, well, there's lots of ones on here. So, so this was a Google thing and it didn't have ones on it when it you know, got <laughs> sent to Berkeley, but then you, know, you guys have something else. So now it's, everything I have is going to have ones next to it probably. Anyway, that's fine. Um, Everything is number one. <laughs> so one of the things that we've been doing in, in Black Women Birthing Justice is really thinking about expanding the way in which we think about sites of violence, 
right? And thinking about how, uh, particularly within our Black Lives Matters work um, movement and say her name movements, we oftentimes think about violence in the streets, violence at the hands of state actors like the police, and that that's a really important place for us to pay attention to. But we also, when we do that, sometimes turn a blind eye to other sites of violence, disablement, and death that are occurring. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in Black Women Birthing Justice is to really think about where the multiple sites where we experience violence, death, and disablement, um, and particularly in terms of putting a gendered lens um, at the forefront, uh, recognizing the spaces where women, gender non-conforming, and transgender folks um, experience violence, but have to incorporate our experiences of birthing. And so we're trying to think about um, rethinking what, um, rethinking birth work uh, beyond the idea of the sort of binary between natural birth, ooh, it's wonderful, and we can all sit around and sing kubaya or horrible medical hospitals and actually think, no, this might be anti-violence work that we're engaged in. So, so that's something I'd like to think about. And then we are here to talk about, well, we're in an academic environment, and so we're, a lot of us, how many people in the room are researchers in some capacity? Scholars, students, those kind of things. Okay, so like 80% of people in the room, so I thought it might be helpful for us to think about um, how might research justice transform the work that we do? Um, and then what might be some of the challenges and dilemmas involved in trying to uh, you know, adopt a research justice framework. So, and then anything else that you want to do. We, we've got plenty of time, right? So we can add that to our agenda. Was there something else that somebody else like, came to this talk for? Because we could try and fit that in too. Seriously, it's a co-creating kind of thing. Okay, well, yeah. Um, I, I'm extremely inspired by the work you do in prison abolition, like marine abolitionism. Um, and so if you can talk a little bit about like uh, state-sanctioned uh, sexual violence committed by the prison industrial complex onto queer and trans and white and women. You would be really excited about that. Awesome. Well, you know, maybe we'll even pick a little bit out of the book because I co-authored a piece in here with Priscilla Ellison, precisely focusing on that, but through the lens of birth justice, so maybe we can bring it into that conversation. So great, thank you. Um, we'll see. We can do everything. How about that? Um, here's another book that, um, under another name and another lifetime, used to be my name, Julia Sideberry. Um, um, I co-edited with the incredible Margaret Okazara Ray, who, if you don't know her, she was one of the original Combahee River Collective, uh, part of that original movement that really kind of jump-started a lot of what we think about in terms of intersectional analysis and black feminist theory. Um, and she's a scholar and uh, just activist and just an amazing person. Um, so we, about um, seven years ago, we started this journey of really thinking about why is it that whenever you announce yourself to be an activist in a scholarly setting, then somehow that that's taken against you. Like that somehow that indicates that perhaps you're not quite as rigorous or not quite as serious. Or in fact that you would really need to pick which one is more important for you. Right? Um, and that was something that I experienced. I remember when I wrote my PhD, my PhD was on the black women's movement in Britain. And I was also an activist within the black women's movement in Britain. Um, and so I had an insider perspective, but I was also really interested in sort of what we do as scholars, which is sort of taking that step back and really reflecting on what have been the strengths and weaknesses and where could we really rethink um, what it would mean to be part of that movement. So I wrote that book, got, it got published, as, sorry, my PhD got published as a book. I thought it was really awesome. And I remember talking, I came to the US, that's a long story that we won't get into. And I remember talking to a professor of women's studies and, hey Helen, another BWBJ, awesome member. I remember talking to a professor of women's studies and, um, and she said, oh yeah, but you know, that book is really, it's a sort of activist polemic more than a scholarly study, right? And so, which by the way, it's called Other Kinds of Dreams. It's not. <laughs> But I understand that what she meant was that there wasn't enough distance between you and the work, right? That somehow there was too much political engagement and too much commitment to social change in the book to be taken seriously as a scholarly study. And so it really started me thinking, and that was way back when, about how could we combine the two so that it wouldn't be, so activism wouldn't be a dirty word within academia, but also so that the activist work that we do would be informed by research, right? And that then in turn, that the research that we do would have some stake within social movements and would have some accountability to the communities that we're so often talking about, right? And so this is a book that came out of that, and we, we talked about activist scholarship as and you can see the quotes, the production of knowledge and pedagogical practices, so both research and teaching through active engagements with and in the service of progressive social movements, so this real reciprocal engagement. Um, we talked about resisting the tendency, tendency to separate out the two terms. Has anyone had that experience? Of, uh, number one, who identifies as 
some kind of spectrum of an activist. Okay, and most of you also identified as like researchers or scholars in some way, right? So, um, who, how many of you have had that experience of seeing that? Well, I have. I'm really have to identify here as a researcher and activist, when I do kind of in my spare time. Okay, what about the other way that your scholarship is what you do in your spare time? Oh, nobody has, you don't have any spare time. <laughs> anyway, the point <laughs> being that oftentimes we're tended to sort of push to present, right, this scholarly, rigorous, detached, objective identity, and then sort of maybe on the side we can be part of these <coughs> movements. And so we wanted to think about how do we prevent, uh, um, prevent that uh, bifurcation, right, that binary. Um, and I think that what was really valuable, it definitely um, fed into the orientation to research that I had when I was involved in the work that you mentioned. Sorry, what was your name? Estifa. Estifa? Yeah. Estifa mentioned yeah. in relationship to the prison industrial complex. So um, for about over a decade, I got very involved with the prison abolitionist movement, uh, the PIC abolitionist movement. And as part of that movement, um, a number of us, I think about people like Ruth Wilson, uh, Wilson Gilmore, um, people like Dylan Rodriguez, uh, we were definitely activists and scholars, and we were very much activist scholars in, in the movement, uh, working for the movement, um, and doing research on, about, and for the movement, right? research that could help us to be more effective. Great, and really important work. But I want to suggest that, um, there's a, that there's a way in which, nevertheless, that type of approach reiterates um, and reifies some of the very problems that we have within research and within what we call research injustice. So what I'm suggesting is that that work, though important, right, that activist scholarship work, though important, actually reproduces some of the binaries between the researcher and the research community, some of the hierarchy, hierarchies between who is trained as a researcher and as an expert and who is the community that's going to be researched about, right? And that those things are not necessarily being dismantled in the way that we want. And I want to just read to you a little bit from an article that um, some of us put together um, from BWBJ, and it's called By Us, Not For Us, Black Women Researching Pregnancy and Childbirth. And this was an opportunity for us to sort of step back from the process of doing the research and think about and talk about what it meant to us. And I just want to read a little section from, um, so we interviewed each other. In fact, um, we were all interviewed and I was interviewed as part of this. And I just want to read a little bit about that journey to give you a little bit of context. So, so I went through a traditional sociology PhD training program. I was exposed to the idea that research outside of the traditional positivist paradigm was possible but I wasn't necessarily exposed to the idea that research even done in a post-positivist way, for example, that engages the emotions, is interested in dialogue, and challenges the typical detachment that requ that's required of a researcher, even researcher research that does that can still disempower communities because if we're not actually engaging and working with communities to define the research agenda and to decide how the research is going to be carried out, it's just softer, kinder, prettier, alienating research. Mm -hmm. So this idea of research as alienation is something that Mike Oliver, who is a critical disability studies researcher, has put forward, and it's the idea that, um, similar to the alienated workforce in like a factory where you have like this, um, you know, you're in a car manufacturing factory, right, and you're just doing the wheels, and all you see over there are wheels, and you never get to see the final product, and you don't certainly get to drive it, right? So you're alienated from the final product of what you're building. So thinking about research in the same way, we could think about this sort of research assembly line, couldn't we? Right, so at the beginning, it's like, well, what's the problem? What's the research agenda? Like, what's our research question? Like, how are we going to address that? What methods might we be used? Who would be actually the participants, right? So we could think about those as all steps on that research assembly line. And the idea that even though we're trying to do this sort of radical, progressive research, when we think about community members, they're only at the end of the assembly line. They, they didn't set the research agenda. They didn't decide on the research question. We did all that, right? And so in the same way, that's that alienation. You only get to see this small section of the research process. Um, so that's the idea that it may be activist alienating research, but it's still alienating research. That was kind of the point, right? So, um, and so then I talk about what happened, right? So after having that insight, I said, I can see a trajectory in my own research where I've gone from being a part of a movement and doing research on, kind of on that movement with people. So people were very aware of the research that I was doing. They were supportive of helping me with this. They thought it was important that it should be documented. And in a sense, I was almost like the research arm of the movement. 
white people saw me as doing something for the black women's movement, but they saw me as doing something for the black women's movement. I don't think they saw themselves as co-researchers. I'm pretty certain they didn't, right? So you kind of get that shift, right? Um, so, you know, that, that and, and again, I'm not trying to um, suggest that that work isn't valuable, but really to get to the idea, if we're going to decolonize research, then we really have to think about decolonizing the very, very starting point, right, where we, how we enter into that research. So, as I say, it's a little bit of a shift away, or, or let's say building on activist scholarship um, rather than staying there. So, moving to research justice was really my next stepping point, and um, I always start out by talking about research injustice so that we can understand why we might want to have research justice, right? Um, and so what does research injustice look like? And this is a question that I get asked a lot, like, well, why do we need research justice? Um, and this is something that um, I talk about again in this article, but also in um, the book um, Birthing Justice. So this is a book that uh, Black Women Birthing Justice um, put together, uh, myself and Alicia Bonaparte, who's down at Pitzer College, um, co-edited, and we all worked to find people who would write inspiring testimonials and so on. But as we started the book, we started talking, thinking about um, what is the history there, and what is it that we're actually writing against, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, what we're doing today is informed by what happened before. And so um, we dug up some history that was painful, and that made us think about how we needed to do things differently. Um, do I want to read it from here? Okay, I'll read this little section. So, um, I don't know if you do, do you do guys do trigger warnings at UC Berkeley? Yeah. We're males, we're a women's college, so we're into big into trigger warnings. So, trigger warning in terms of this material is some difficult material in here. Okay. Um, so, when natural birth advocates portray medicalized birth as a patriarchal intervention by male doctors, they gloss over the racial origins of the field of obstetrics. South Carolina physician J. Marion Sims, honored as the father of American gynecology, developed instruments such as the speculum. Anyone had any experience with that? <laughs> I avoid those appointments at all costs. Oops. And medical techniques that lay the foundation for modern day obstetrics. Sims's medical advances would not have been possible without unhindered access to the bodies of 11 enslaved black women at a time when physicians commonly dealt with white women's gynecological problems by touch only to safeguard their honor. The enslaved women had vesicovaginal fistulas, ruptures between the vagina and the bladder and rectum that caused constant leakage of urine and fecal matter. Harriet Washington tells the grueling story of the five years during which Sims performed numerous experimental surgeries, slicing open the vaginal tissues of the women he had addicted to morphine as his assistants held them down by force. Rationalizing that black women were closer to livestock than humans and thus had a greater pain tolerance, Sims refused to use anesthesia on the women, even though a dose of ether could have spared them their agony. One of the women, Anaka, subsequently became the first successful fistula patient, but only after 30 torturous surgeries. These soul-destroying experiments were carried out on Anaka and her sisters not because of their gender alone. Instead, they suffered because, as chattel under a system of racial and economic oppression, they had no means to protect themselves from torture in the name of medical progress. And then I could then go on and I talk a little bit about the invention of the cesarean section. The cesarean section as a surgery was actually developed by uh, Francois-Marie Prevost, who is a Louisiana surgeon, who in the 1820s conducted experimental procedures on enslaved African-American women um, and again, this was a time when cutting open the abdomen was basically a death sentence. And so by the time they successfully reached their first successful C-section, of course, many lives had been lost. Um, and, I put, and I then go on to say, um, Washington labels this process and its ongoing legacy medical apartheid. The development of medicalized childbirth owes much to the system of medical apartheid and can be accurately described as obstetrical apartheid a convergence of patriarchal medical heroics, racialized medical violence, economic exploitation, and a cavalier disregard of black women's well-being. So when we think about research, right, and we think about the, what does it mean for um, scientific knowledge to be developed on the basis of violence that has been inflicted on the bodies most, um, in this case, of black women, we also, of course, have many examples of, Examples from 
the Holmesburg prison experiments, the Tuskegee experiments, of similar kinds of violence inflicted on African American men, and we also can think about um, those inflicted on indigenous peoples and so on. So, so research ju injustice then has this long history, right? Um, but it's not something that's just disappeared into history, right? And so that's something that we picked up in this article and talk about um, in relationship to how does that show up today? So let me see if I can find that little section for you real quick. Um, so how can we ensure that these abuses can never happen again, right? So despite the measures that we have, so what do we know? Well, we know that since then they've introduced Anyone submitted an ethics pr a proposal for, through your IRB, right? So we have all kinds of uh, processes in place supposedly to protect from those kinds of egregious abuses. But I would argue that despite of these measures, to, uh, so regardless of these measure, measures, black birthing women continue to be the subjects of research over which we have no say. Huge sums of federal money fund research institutions where research is carried out by and about black women's perinatal experiences. Yet we are seldom consulted about what research would be helpful to address the crisis in maternal health in our communities or how that research should be carried out. Today, many researchers carry out research on black women, pregnancy and childbirth outcomes without ever interacting with a single black woman. Let me just read that to you again because I think that's pretty profound. Today, many researchers carry out research on black women, pregnancy and childbirth outcomes without ever interacting with a single black woman. Instead, researchers rely on birth and death records and medical histories, which are gleaned without our explicit consent. Once again, our voices are silenced, our lives, life, lived experiences are erased, and our interpretations of how we live in our bodies, how we carry and push out our babies, are ignored. While ethical protocols may protect us from the explicit violence that we've documented, Black women continue to experience medical research injustice that is rooted in the social relations of medical apartheid. Only when the power dynamics of research are completely transformed and birthing women become rec recognized as the experts of our own experiences will medical research become a tool for real social change. And that is the goal of research justice. And so one of the things, I teach a class um, on research methods with communities of color. Um, and, in the, and the class is required for ethnic studies um, majors, but it's also required for health, uh, um, public health majors. So it's actually a really cool group who's, that's in the class. Um, and one of the things that we look at is we explore some of that history of the violence that has been done in the name of medical advances, right? And then who has borne the brunt of that violence? Who has actually had the benefit of the medical advances and then who's been expected to carry the, the, the pain of them? Um, and we use that to really think about, well, what kind of alternative research practices would we want to create, right? And bearing in mind, um, you know, at Mills we have um, over 50% students of color, um, a majority of students are um, low-income students, you know, a large number of students are first in their family to go to college. So, you know, it's a community that would be the community that would be those who would be bearing the brunt, right, of that research practice. Um, so that's something I would want us to really uh, reflect on, that as researchers, what we're doing is not built on a blank slate, right? That there is so much research that's gone before us that has set the precedent and that experiences, those experiences really live on in the bodies and in that intergenerational memory of our communities, right? And so we have, I think, a really powerful incentive to think about doing something radically different, okay? Um, and so what, what might that radically different thing uh, be? This is a slide that comes from Data Center Research for Justice. Um, Data Center, um, until very recently, was a uh, nonprofit organization in Oakland that had been around for several decades. I can't remember how many people remember what, what year it was founded. Um, recently, unfortunately, um, it folded. Um, the organization still has materials that you can get access to on their website and so on, but in terms of doing ongoing work, they're no longer doing that. Um, but we work with them very closely, the Ethnic Studies Department at, at Mills work very closely with them and continue to use those materials. So one of the things that they talked about is the ways in which different types of knowledge are valued and the ways in which in academia we validate and really reinforce this hierarchy of knowledge. Um, and so these are some of the types of knowledge that they talk about that communities hold, experiential, cultural, and spiritual knowledge. Um, we talk about, in our work, we talk about sacred knowledge embodied knowledge, of course, is really important for the work we do around birthing. Um, 
and intergenerational knowledge would be the other piece that I would add. So all of these forms of knowledge are held within communities. You don't need a PhD to be able to access them, right? Um, and yet they are typically not seen as important. Um, mainstream knowledge, they would really be thinking about both the knowledge that is produced by policymakers and um, sort of uh, research think tanks as well as within the academic setting, right? Um, and so the idea within research justice is that not that um, we as researchers have the knowledge and we're going to go into communities and share it, but instead that there are multiple sites of different forms of equally important knowledge and that how can we create um, some kind of context in which we're able to share those. Um, and so you get that kind of vision of research justice that, that they put forward. So all of this was in my head, right? I was teaching this class on research methods, had changed it to a research justice class. It used to just be a research methods class. Um, had gone through this journey of activist scholarship through, well, traditional PhD in sociology through to activist scholarship, which was a radical departure from the way I was trained to then even thinking that's not enough, we need to do something else. Um, and then six years ago, I, a hmm, bit more than six years ago, got pregnant and, <laughs> and um, had an extremely um, baffling experience with the maternal health system. Um, uh, went from feeling that I was this strong, healthy person who was just totally equipped to carry and then push out a baby to realizing that I was actually an at-risk um, AMA. Anyone been AMA in here? Oh, oh, there, you know what it means, right? It's called advanced maternal age. If you combine... If, did they really? Okay, so I was geriatric. I didn't even know that. So I was actually labeled AMA, which means at-risk, high-risk pregnancy. And then on top of that, as an African-American woman, or as an African woman, then they also put in the at-risk category. So I was a sort of double whammy at-risk. And so all the alarm bells and sirens were going off whenever I walked into the doctor's uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, room. Um, and on top of that, I had fibroids. And um, anybody, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a black thing. I wouldn't say it's just a black thing, but a lot of black women have fibroids. And apparently have been pushing out babies for a long time with fibroids, but nevertheless, now they can see them on the little scan, they get very excited about them and think we should have a C-section. Yeah, did you have a question? I have a question about research justice yes. and your vision. Yes. So I'm in the School of Public Health here, and we yes. talk a lot about community-based participatory research. Yes. Is there, do you distinguish between those two ideas? Yes. Can we hold that thought and sure. come back to it? But don't let us not come back to it. Okay. okay. Thank you. It's a really important question. Um, so anyway, so I went through this journey and um, realized that there was something profoundly wrong with what was going on in the maternal health care system, particularly in relation to black women. Um, had a conversation with a friend of mine who uh, was a youth advocate, was in her 20s, and had also had a, a different kind of challenging experience. She had actually decided to have a home birth, but her pa family had called the paramedics who had tried to force her into the ambulance while she was in labor in her bathroom, mm -hmm. and then had... Um, made her sign, basically bullied her and made her sign that, a waiver saying that if the baby died that she would be fully responsible, that was the, their words, um, while in labor. Um, and so we came together and we talked and said, well, there's something clearly deeply wrong, what can we do about it? And I said, of course, you know, because I am an activist scholar, we should do a research project. Um, and so one of the things that we did was said, okay, well, we want to do this in this research justice where we don't want to think about it in terms of there being an expert researcher in the community. We want to start out with this co-creation. And so let's create a research team, right? Makes sense. Any researchers in the room, that's the first thing you do, right? Par two, you would kind of think about having a research team, which would involve co-researchers who are from the directly impacted community, right? So that was the starting point. Um, so we began to reach out to people. I think, were you at that first meeting, Linda? You probably were. Um, so uh, Linda was a long-term practicing doula for like, what, 25 years or something. Um, so folks who are involved in the birth world, folks who we just knew would be interested in this topic. And, and we called folks together. And at that very first meeting, I sort of laid out what, what I thought research justice was all about or how we could do a research project, having a research team, and that you could all be co-researchers. And I can't remember exactly what Linda said, but she probably laughed just like she's laughing right now. And they gently said, um, ah, no, that's not really what we're going to do. Um, what we really need is we need an organization. We need a collective. We need something that is going to be not only doing the research, but pushing the work forward. We don't have time to sit and do the research for five years and then do the work. Um, we actually need to be creating something right now. And so what we're going to do is that we're actually going to create a collective. And um, so we're going to brainstorm a name. And here it is. Black Women Birthing Justice. So we walked out of that first 
meeting, not having a research team, but having an organization that eventually, and this is actually a beautiful logo that was designed for us by African-American uh, local artists in San Francisco, Nancy Cato. Um, that didn't come to a little bit later, but the, the name came out of that. Um, and so this is what was actually created um, in 2011 when we came together. And part of that is that that group would have a research arm that would be something we would do. Um, and so that was the piece that, um, that I was very involved in, although I've been involved in all of it. Okay. Um, so there's already that sort of sign that within the research justice framework, there's a lot of letting go of like, you walk in with your idea right, of what you think is going to happen. And then what actually happens is generated by the group. And so, of course, it can be far exceed and be way better than what you really imagined. Right? Um, so Black Women Building Justice has much broader goals than simply to do research and find out what's wrong with the maternal health care system. Although finding out what's wrong with the maternal health care system and what black women want to see different would be an important step in moving towards succeeding with these goals, right? Um, so really thinking about putting a research agenda into the context of work that communities are trying to achieve, right? Um, and so empowering black pregnant individuals. Um, so there was a long journey, I would say, probably about a two-year journey where we initially were talking entirely about black women. If you think about just the general language that we use, we talk about pregnant women, right? We don't talk about pregnant individuals or pregnant people. Right? Um, so there's a gendered binary that's automatically assumed when we start thinking about pregnancy and childbirth. Um, as we went through this project, we began to realize, of course, that everybody who is pregnant does not necessarily identify as a woman, right? Um, and that, in fact, because we live in a society, in a world in which there's an enormous amount of gender fluidity, um, that people can enter into pregnancy from many different sites on the gender spectrum. Right? Um, so, for example, you could be a man, who is pregnant. For example, in our book, we have a, a, a great um, article, that, chapter that I really recommend that you read by Cyrus Ware, and it's called Confessions of a Black Trans Man. Um, and so what does it mean to live and have lived in society as a man for a number of years and then to actually get pregnant and then for your body to go through what a body goes through. Um, if you've had top surgery, your breasts will probably grow back, right? Um, so that kind of uh, uh, experience. So we wanted to recognize that, and over the couple of years, um, we talked about this and began to identify that we needed to shift our language, and that shifting the language would be a starting point to beginning to understand the work that we do differently. So that's uh, why you'll notice that there's some of the stuff that I read says women, and some of it sort of starts to shift towards pregnant person. Um, so some of the obvious ones, in, um, improving access to care, um, as well as traditional alternatives. Um, recognizing that violence creates trauma, right? And that many of our communities are living with trauma. Uh, and so healing birth trauma would be central to the work of decolonization, right? Um, incorporating and understanding that um, those who are incarcerated experience all of these forms of violence at a much, more, at a much greater rate. Um, and so incorporating that, um, recognizing the long history of breastfeeding abuses within the African-American community and trying to turn that around. Um, and incorporating birth justice within all progressive movements. So, as you can see, it was a, the, the agenda that I first went in with was quite a, kind of exploded um, by the group's vision. Um, so, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is birth justice. Um, so, we talked about research justice, and we're also thinking about birth justice. Um, oftentimes, when we think about an alternative to the traditional or I shouldn't say traditional, when we think about an alternative to the medicalized um, birthing model, we think about the sort of natural birth movement. And I don't know what your sort of take on that is, but frequently the image of somebody who is an advocate for natural birth, well, let me just ask you, what is the image that you have of somebody who's an advocate for natural birth, apart from me, Linda and Helen, of course, you've got to pretend you, know, pretend you never met us. <laughs> Do we have any images about like what somebody's into natural birth? White women. White women. Anything else? Hippies? Mm -hmm. Any others? People with money. People with money. That kind of sums it up, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in, in, in our research, right? Like people with right? right? <laughs> in our research, that's exactly what black women were saying. They were like, oh, you know, first of all, I thought that anything to do with natural birth was, I remember, the, I'll never forget this one, crunchy and granola. I said, what do you mean crunching? What does that even mean, crunching granola? Well, you know, crunchy, kind of like hippie white people who have money to buy fresh, natural granola. I mean, it was just an amazing thing. So you kind of got it. You got the class, you got race, 
right? And then you've got kind of a political orientation towards something alternative from the mainstream, right? So that's what we often think about when we talk about natural birth, right? But when we actually look at who is most um, experiencing violence and uh, disproportionate rates of death as a result of the medicalized model of birth, then, and so therefore, who would most benefit from alternatives? It would be communities of color, mm. right? And particularly black women. So black women are three to four times more likely than white women in the state of California to die as a result of getting pregnant, right? So therefore, we might have a particular interest in some alternative, but, um, but not what that has been portrayed as in terms of natural birth, right? Um, so then what might be different? If natural birth has, historically, has tended to be seen as a midwifery for getting legalization of midwifery, for example, without thinking about whether people can afford midwifery, right? Then it doesn't have an economic justice lens, so it's not an intersectional analysis. And so the reproductive um, justice movement has put forward a much more intersectional analysis that says that having something legal, if it's not accessible, doesn't mean anything in terms of the intersections of economic, racial, and gender justice, right? Um, so it's really that is the lens that um, we're looking at in terms of birth justice. Um, and that we're thinking about lack of access, for example, to midwifery or to prenatal care, but also overuse of medical interventions. And so that we're caught in both, and we experience different versions of this in different spaces. So in the um, chapter that we have here about pregnant incarcerated women, one of the themes that clearly comes through is incarcerated women who are in labor, um, and suffering from extreme pain, um, being denied the kinds of pain uh, medications mm -hmm. that other women would be given. However, we also have to think about in a different context tried that where women are trying to have a medication-free birth, that having that foisted on them can also be a form of oppression, right? So it's complicated. It's not just one simple answer. Um, uh, so challenging thinking about it in a complex way that thinks about both overuse and um, and also lack of access, right? That both of those are form of forms of birth injustice, um, and then thinking about access beyond traditional notion, so beyond uh, the medicalized model, but also to traditional and indigenous birth workers. Um, so as a result of thinking about this work, I mentioned we will pull together this book, and I wanted to talk about this a little bit because. It's an example, I think, of what some aspects of what we do as scholars um, could look like and does look like when you take a research justice lens. So, who's published a book in here? Any experiences in publishing books? So, well, so a lot of ac uh, academics publish books. It's one of the things we do, right? Um, and typically, and I've had this experience, you know, you, you work really hard on writing this book. You may have somebody that you're working with in terms of an editor and so on. Um, you get a contract with the press. And, you know, the book comes out, and if you're lucky, you get to go back and forth a bit about the cover design, and you don't have some horrible picture uh, on the front cover. That's a serious issue, because on my book on Global Lockdown, I, I had a um, fabulous artist mural, which, an, which was an anti-prison mural, but the original design that came back from the press was a white woman sitting between a sort of, ha in, a, in a big giant handcuff, looking down. <laughs> like, well, where's the agency? Like, where's the racial diversity? What? Anyway, so the cover issue can be an issue. But basically, uh, it's basically you and your press and your editor. That, that's typically what it looks like, right? Um, this journey was really different. One thing that happened is that oh, I should have bought the video and I didn't think of that. Didn't think we'd have time. But anyway, um, we wanted to publish in this book um, a number of quilt blocks. So we put out a call and we said, if you are an at birth worker, an activist, if you are somebody you've experienced birth and you have something to say about it, um, if you're a scholar that writes about it, we want to hear from you. And one of the things that came back to us was, um, well, that's all well and good, but there's a story that can't be told, right? And that story is all of the black women who have lost their lives unnecessarily due to pregnancy um, or due to the ways in which our system treats pregnancy. Um, how are you going to depict those? And um, one of the women who um, talked to with us was a woman called Maddie, and she's an activist who um, had lost her daughter um, as a result of her daughter being given Cytotec to induce labor. And this is a drug that ultimately led to her daughter dying um, and also the baby being lost. Um, and she said, well, I was part of a project that we created these beautiful quilt blocks 
to memorialize and recognize those lives? Why don't you include those as part of this book to, so that we can sort of have that presence? And also thinking about different types of knowledge that we talked about earlier, that there's something that's really sacred about that memorial and having that as a way to think about um, connecting all of the ways in which we can respond, right? Um, and so we wanted to do that, and we thought that was a great idea. So we said to the press, hey, we've got a great idea. We have these beautiful color quilt blocks. Well, in the publishing world, anything that's now a color insert in a book is just a lot of money. And so they were like, beautiful idea, but we can't do it. We could maybe think about black and white. And we said, no, that's, that's just not going to depict you know, what went into these. Um, and so because this book is part of a community activist project, Whose idea was it to do a crowdfunding? I don't know. Was it? I, was, I don't know. Was it you? Helen? It was probably Helen. And we have people with different interests, and so of course we have somebody on the group who's like knows how to make films. We have somebody on the group who has done Kickstarter and Indiegogo and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, anyone Indiegogoing your tuition this semester? I don't know. Okay. Anyway, um, so you know these are like crowdfunding. You put it out on the internet. You make a video. You um, and you invite people to support something. And we ended up with over a hundred people putting in funds and raising over $5,000 that enabled us to <coughs> incorporate um, this section. And I just want to actually show you, and I didn't put it in my slideshow, so I'm going to have to show you in the book. Um, but where is she? There she is. There's Talita. Uh, sorry, so not Talita. There's um, Tasha. I beg your pardon. Talita's one of our group members. There's Tasha. <laughs> and um, so, t so Marty Oden, that's the piece that, that, that she had contributed. And um, you can have a look at them outside. We've got some books out there. Um, so we ended up doing a crowdfunding campaign to support this book. Um, and the press were kind of baffled, like, wow, we've never really had anybody offer to give us some money to help publish the book. But hey, um, you know, we ended up having 100 people who felt that they were co-creating this book with us. Um, you know, we ended up um, really creating movement as we were publishing a book. Um, so many people were involved. And at the end of the process, we created this idea of these kitchen table reading circles where people could, we would... Um, post um, chapters of the book online so that you could download it for free um, and put out some questions. We created a study guide, what are the kinds of conversation we might have in community settings, in doula trainings, um, in you know, youth settings, in classrooms, um, to kind of encourage this to be really a movement book rather than just something that gets published. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit as an example. Um, Where's Julian? Oh yeah, and there's Julian, I'm sorry, yes. And of course, um, I'll post it with Bill as one of our members, Julian. Um, and so we put together the book but we also wanted to gather those stories and particularly focus on California um, because this is where we're located um, and we decided that the best way that we could do that was to document 100 black women's birth stories mm -hmm. so this is a different 100 people than the people who funded the Kickstarter by the way mm -hmm. who was all kinds of people um, and that as part of that process we would be both building community because we'd be creating what we call sharing circles where people could come together, tell their stories, be heard, share with each other, and then be invited to be part of the research team. And so a number of people joined BWBJ as a result of having shared their story and then learning about what we were trying to do, and then they decided to become collective members. Um, and so um, this is and that's this, this is one of the women who shared her story. All the photos of babies and people that were part of our project, they're not stock photos. We don't, we don't use stock photos. Um, Oh, that went funny too. Okay, so we had action research goals. Um, and as you can see now, we've begun to shift from women to people. So we've already done that kind of shift around doing some work around gender and gender identity. Um, and our goals were action oriented. Uh, we didn't just want to find out what was wrong and broken with the system, that we wanted to actually change it. Uh, we wanted to change it by putting pressure on those who had the power and had the resources to make change and create accountability. Um, and we also wanted to um, create change by opening up the doors to alternatives, right? So that we're not all just um, uh, going to Kaiser or going to uh, Highland because we don't think we have alternative choices, right? Um, so we had a few different action research goals. Um, we started out with what we already knew, and interestingly enough, a lot of us didn't already know it, right? So what I mean by that is that this is well documented, and yet whenever I go out and do a talk and put this information up there, people are shocked. So that again speaks to the way in which there's been silencing of this. So that one in seven um, black infants in California are born too soon or too small, which is directly connected to infant mortality, right? That, um, and the, the way that we write it, wrote it in our report is that um, a black child born in a California city today is um, twice as likely um, to not 
reach their first birthday or have a first birthday party than a white child born in the same California city today. Right? So really kind of trying to humanize and think about uh, what are those, instead of just putting those ratios that we often see that seem really dehumanizing, right? Um, and then this is sort of the big one that um, we, we talk about a lot. But I also want us to think about um, what does this mean for me if I'm a black person who is pregnant, right? So one of the things that we tend to do as activists is we highlight the bad news. But this is definitely some bad news and it needs to be highlighted, right? It's really important. But then that also can contribute to what we call the culture of fear around birth that then can make people even more vulnerable to uh, en enrolling themselves in the kinds of processes that actually result in these kind of outcomes. In other words, a hyper-medicalized, highly monitored pregnancy and birth, right? And we talk about that a little bit here in, um, in the introduction. Um, we said that despite the dire st statistics, Birth is not a medical emergency. Every life matters and every death is a cause for concern and action. Yet a focus on racial disparities in maternal and infant mortality can create a skewed impression of pregnancy as dangerous, leading to the belief that the desire for normal or natural birth is irresponsible or a luxury that black women in particular can't afford. This belief overlooks the long history of traditional birthing practices in black communities. The idea that birth is an emergency requiring medical supervision and intervention has resulted in an expensive maternal health care system that dedicates millions of dollars to procedures and surgeries that experts describe as unnecessary, while failing to provide accessible, culturally sensitive, and equitable care for black women and other marginalized communities. Right? So it's holding those tensions, it's constantly holding these ambiguities, right? that on the one hand, we want to highlight um, you know, these kind of health disparities, but on the other hand, we also want to empower people to believe that they still have alternatives, right? Um, so, what some of the things that came up, and uh, we're very proud that this is our cover design to the report. Mm -hmm. Yes? I just want to say also, like back to the last slide, of yes. just like listing statistics like this mm -hmm. without um, any analysis of why mm -hmm. and what the real truth mm -hmm. is behind it mm -hmm. perpetuates the ideas that we have that black people or people of color are somehow different or mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. inferior than white mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we don't, we, you know, consciously believe, but that's in the, the subconscious of our culture. Mm -hmm. And so, so often it's just listed. Right. And then it goes like, well, yeah. Right. Of course, that, that's so. Well, the other piece is that, well, that black women are just so much more at risk because obviously look at the lives we're living. So therefore, we need to go and get the most medical care we could probably get, possibly get. So like get as many scans and as many, right, which actually we know those very interventions are the things that oftentimes lead to things like C-sections, which uh, result in many of these problems, right? Um, and, re and research on genetic differences mm -hmm. between quote-unquote races mm -hmm. are funded like two or three times more often than white mm -hmm. um, than the, than the uh, determinants of health type research. Interesting. You've got to add that to our yeah. conversation about research. Who gets the money, right? That's mm -hmm. a really important question. Um, so, you know, you at some point in the near future, because the report's going to be out in the next month, you'll be able to have a look at some of the things we found out. But um, I just wanted to highlight what some of those were before I kind of moved on, because uh, I know that time is, is, is running short. Uh, but these were some of the th things that we identified. One of the things that was really interesting was how many black women would actually turn into home birth. Um, as a response to the fact that they were very aware that there was a broken maternal health care system and that they were very afraid of going to a hospital where they felt that they would likely have interventions they didn't want and possibly outcomes that would be detrimental to the health of themselves and their infants. Um, and so this idea that natural birth is white and crunching granola, going back to that, there's actually this very vibrant black home birth scene which is extremely alternative uh, and very much grounded in a sort of Afrocentric ways of taking care of oneself and one's body and one's community. Um, so um, I'm not going to dwell there because you can read the report. Um, I want to just I read a few of these uh, fun quotes from our friends in the audience here. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up by talking about what the being part of a research justice project meant for us. Um, so um, one of the things that narratives that's created through talking about uh, participatory action research, and I think our friend is gone who was asking that question, but. Um, so community-based um, participatory action research has a narrative of the researcher um, putting 
research capabilities into the hands of deprived communities so that they then can become researchers that can determine um, outcomes that can support their own um, agendas. And that idea suggests that there's this sort of transfer of information, almost like a kind of banking system of knowledge, right? Where, the, again, the researcher who's trained in the academic setting is positioned as the expert with the most knowledge, and then their job is then to share that knowledge with the community so the community can do the research. Um, this, I think, um, this, these quotes kind of somewhat interrupt that. Interrupt that. Um, the first one is from Renesha, who's there on the left. Uh, she says, I do see myself as a researcher because I'm always trying to figure out what's going and, and what's the cause of issues. And you really can't figure that out unless you do research and you document things. And being part of BWBJ definitely affirmed visualizing myself as a researcher. So bearing in mind that the first research project, official research project that Vanessa had been involved on was this project with BWBJ. But she identified herself prior to that as a researcher because just being a black young woman navigating life um, and figuring out how to survive in East Oakland um, and in the particular neighborhood that she lived in was an act of everyday research and vigilance, right? Um, and so, yes, naming herself and visualizing herself as a researcher was something that she did as a result of the study, but becoming a researcher, not so much, right? So I thought that was really important to acknowledging the ways in which our communities are rich with knowledge, right, and with research. Um, there's me. Um, we already talked about that, so we're going to have to read that one again. Um, so perhaps myself as a more formal um, path to becoming a researcher, right, getting that research training. Um, but then there's Linda, who just made me laugh, so I had to put her in here. I didn't know she was going to be here today. Linda, why don't you read your quote for us? Let's not. <laughs> I don't see myself as a researcher. Yeah, that's probably the farthest thing ever from my mind that I'm a researcher. I think probably because of the place I stand in BWPJ, I am a researcher, but I don't see it that way. I see it as I'm a woman who's with a group of other women trying to enable some change. And if research is a label that has to go on it, so be it. You know, it was news to me that I was a researcher, actually. Ha, ha, ha. Nice to know that I'm a researcher. I'll add that to my resume that I'm a researcher. But I don't see myself as a researcher. <laughs> and I just love this. This really blew my mind because bearing in mind that we hadn't really had this conversation. We were just doing the thing, right? And then we, you know, we got invited to contribute to this um, book, uh, Research Justice. And so we started interviewing each other about what we thought. And then Linda went and blew my mind by telling me that all this time, we've been working for like four years on this research project. She was never a researcher. And in fact, earlier, actually in the, in the chapter as well, Early on, she says, this was never really a research project. It, I never even thought it was a research project. It was a project about creating some change and talking to some women about how we would do that, you know. Um, and so, again, sort of really challenging that notion of, of the way in which it's, I think, being put, put um, together in most community-based research models. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, um, again, the idea that in a community-based research model, you're supposed to go and help the community transform. But actually, in research justice, we're all being transformed, right? Um, I don't know if there's Linda again. I don't want to embarrass her. Oh, let me read Fatima. Fatima was actually a student at Mills, and she also became part of this project. And, um, and she was really, really transformed by it. She said, it's given me a new language and a kind of invisible armor. It's deep to me. It's made me braver. I'm not as afraid anymore to speak up. I'm not afraid to speak out against injustice and have a voice or point of view. I know even more that my knowledge, especially the knowledge that I've gained from my life experiences, is unique and legitimate. I'm empowered to be more intellectually and spiritually, to be more of who I already am, to own and stand in my intellectual power as a black woman, and to utilize my mind in ways I never thought were possible in the larger world, even within academia where my stories or experiences aren't always honored. And I think, again, this is such a powerful testimony to both recognizing that the this, the place that she really finds her strength and her power is, is the knowledge that she's gained from her life experiences, right? But then recognizing that that then is something that she can bring to this research project. Um, and again, thinking about intellectually and spiritually, right? recognizing that sacred knowledge as well, um, I think was really important. Um, one of the things that we, I didn't get, we didn't get to talk about much in this chapter because uh, we, um, we had a word count limitation issue uh, with some of the issues of power that came up um, while doing this project. So just like any other kind of anti-oppressive research agenda, um, issues of power and accountability are challenges and struggles, right? Um, consensus versus collective decision making. For at least the first two years, would you say, we had this consensus um, decision making where we basically, we would just talk about it and then we'd all say, yeah, okay, let's do it. And then we do it. Um, then we had a member who came on board who said, um, when you all talk about these things and then you just move forward, there's no space for my voice if I don't agree. 
because there's a sense that everyone's in agreement and that it's hard to sort of say, but I don't really agree. So we realized that we actually had to have a more formalized decision making so that people could be encouraged to disagree. Um, and so we adopted a process that has been created by Insight, Women of Color Against Violence, which is a collective of radical women of color. And they have a system in their own meetings um, where they vote by fingers. And the first is like, if you absolutely agree, it's fantastic, it's one. If you think it's pretty good, it's two. If you, if you have a question, it's three. If you, um, you have some concerns, it's four. And if you want to block it, it's five, right? But the thing is that you have to vote. And so what we notice is that people might be just going along, but there's a piece that they really hadn't understood, and so they just go along. But with this one, you have to put a four up and say, actually, I still have some questions that I don't understand. So it was a way of really creating more participation in decision-making that was really important. Um, descent and silencing, we had an almost blowout with the logo. Um, one of our members had identified somebody who was able to come forward with a, a logo design, and it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty good, but it wasn't excellent. It was good, but it just it didn't speak to and resonate with everybody. And so again, we had some members who were like, we've been trying to get a logo forever, let's just go with it. And plus, they only want $50 for the design, it's a pretty good deal. And then the other members were like, no, it's, it's good, but it's not excellent, we want to keep, you know. And, um, and, you know, that process was really challenging because, again, there was a sense in which dissenting was holding up this really powerful and important work. Um, and how do we actually move that forward? Um, in the end, we didn't go with the $50 logo. We waited, and then Nancy appeared and volunteered, and we have the logo that we all loved, and it's the logo of our dreams, so there you go. Um, time and labor, who's getting paid? Um, we talk a lot about this in the, in the chapter. Um, who's getting paid in all of this? I mean, the reality is that as an academic, um, I have, you know, Chris has, a third of our jobs is related to, or maybe I don't know how they calculate the account, it's probably like 80% <laughs> is scholarship, right? For us at Mills, it's like a third teaching, a third service advising, that kind of thing, and a third scholarship research. Um, and so there's something quantified there. And so if I want to take a whole Thursday afternoon to work on this research project, it's a part of my job. On the other hand, if it's, you're not an academic and you, you, can't, you can't just take your Thursday afternoon from work and say, I'm going to sit here on my computer, unless you're really secretive about it, <laughs> right? So who's really getting paid? Um, and how does that really play out in terms of the kind of time that we have available is, is a challenge. Um, and particularly when we think about the caring labor that um, black folks do, um, particularly black women, um, then really that this could be seen as a kind of community caring labor that's added on top of the free unpaid caring labor we do in our communities and families, which is added on top of a lot of the unpaid caring labor or unacknowledged caring labor we do in our workplaces, right? Where we're kind of like having to take care of everyone's emotions. Um, so there was just like layers and layers and layers and layers of additional labor that we could really think about. Um, and then age, class, and gender identity. We, we, I talked a bit about gender identity, but just thinking about how um, age and experience show up in a group in terms of giving more weight to certain people's articulation of problems and solutions and so on. So these are things that are still real. So which is just to say that research justice is just like any other methodology that involves people. There's power dynamics in there and we can't um, gloss them over, right? Um, and so I'm going to wrap up and just kind of open it up, but I want to just put it out there that if you're interested, you're very welcome to host a kitchen table reading circle, which means get a group of people together, get some copies of the book, and start you know, talking about the questions and discussing them. And we're happy to come visit or to Skype in with you and chat with you know, what you think about that. Um, it's all part of our community-based um, getting the word out. Um, the report that I talked about is going to be coming out in December. And we will make sure that Chris gets an invite so that he can spread the word out here. Um, and that we'll be using these hashtags so you can follow us on those hashtags or you can check out the website. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes uh, for some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Would you mind introducing yourself just so we know who you are? Great. And I was interested in, in addition to getting the work out, and through the publication, you're also involved in the research that you're doing with the report. How, because I'm interested in activist research myself, but I don't do any, I think of it more as policy oriented research than I'm trying to do. What do you? do to bring about change? What additional things? Which is interesting to me. Yeah, could you just clarify for me the piece I didn't quite hear? So you think about activist research as, as policy work, or you think of your own work as policy work? I didn't quite catch um, that. Yes, I think to me it's different, activist and policy, but I think, okay. I guess I'm interested in, I guess 
question is, what else are you doing to bring about change, and maybe in the policy field as well? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that oftentimes we think about, they are related of course, right? Any policy change should be in, influenced by grassroots activism, otherwise it's kind of meaningless, right? So, but you, I see your point in terms of like, I think about grassroots mobilization and organizing people to come together versus perhaps influencing and targeting policymakers. So with this report, we identified um, different audiences. So we definitely identified black pregnant individuals in their communities and families as one. So that would be more the kind of base building, community organizing piece. But we also re um, identified health um, practitioners, um, decision makers such as those who run hospitals, the HMOs, um, and legislator, le legislation, um, and alternative birth workers. So we kind of identified key audiences. And we, as part of this report, and, and actually it's a great question because Typically, as an academic, when you do this amount of research, like this is a five-year research project, which has just oodles of qualitative data. Mm -hmm. Typically, by now, it would I would have had a book contract, and I would have been like halfway through a book, right? Instead of having written a 150-page human rights report, mm -hmm. and so that's also part of kind of the trade-off, right? So, um, so to, to respond to that, the report deciding to write a human rights report and then to have recommendations within that in the way that you obviously can't within a published book, right, um, is part of the activist agenda. Um, what we're going to be doing with that is that we, um, uh, Christine Morton, who is the, one of the lead, uh, she's a medical researcher at Stanford, but she's also one of the lead people in the California Quality Maternal Health Care Collaborative, which is the kind of co uh, umbrella group that is tasked with looking at maternal health care in the state. Um, it involves everybody from legislators to um, doctors and so on. Um, um, wrote the foreword and is supporting us in actually getting the word out. So we're going to be having a strategy session where we invite all of those key people to sit around the table and to talk about our recommendations and then to develop an action plan depending on what area they're involved in. So this is for, for me as an academic, this is probably the most thick into policy I've been uh, because I've typically been doing like kind of base building, grassroots organizing or uh, kind of the work I do on campus. Um, but it felt that if we wanted to see the change that we needed to, that we needed to have happen, we needed to be talking to those folks. And so that's kind of how we've um, moved it forward. But I would definitely say it's, um, I mean, that's, that's the whole t group. That's definitely not just what I'm doing, but that's what we're all doing, yeah. Oh, we didn't really talk about incarceration too much, huh? But go oh, ahead. No, that's totally fine. Um, just thank you for your talk, and I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank um, you. So a couple of questions. You've already spoken, like, on a lot of like a lot of this already, but if you wish to elaborate, so considering that you still have the power as a researcher and academic to interpret and represent uh, these women's um, and like people's information, how do you hold yourself accountable as a researcher um, when there's still like the power dynamics of the of like the Western imposed power dynamics mm -hmm. of like the researcher subject hierarchy, mm -hmm. and how do you? Uh, how can you contribute to dismantling that? Mm -hmm. And uh, second question is... Uh, I love like your question. Do you want to come take my class? I would just love to have I you in my class. I like cited you in some of your research and <laughs> uh, A lot of this I also learned from Chris from taking his class, so... <laughs> we, we could co-teach something, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so second question, mm -hmm. as a researcher, I found a lot of like... Uh, communities and students of color find um, themselves a little defensive to like theory and um, mm -hmm. research work. Mm -hmm. When really, like when you question research, it's like where does it really come from in the first place? Mm -hmm. When like historically we have Western researchers and anthropologists enter sites and communities of color mm -hmm. to extract information from them and mm -hmm. then like appropriate that and butcher it mm -hmm. for like, their own like capital right. profit benefit mm -hmm. and then make this information completely inaccess inaccessible to mm -hmm. these communities in the first place. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, how can you, so like I'm kind of struggling with uh, empowering like communities and students of color mm -hmm. as like, uh, as, uh, as, um, as sources of expertise mm -hmm. in their communities and mm -hmm. agents of knowledge production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fabulous questions. Um, and I'll throw it back to you and you can tell me what you think. But um, so the first one, I, absolutely, it's a constant challenge, right? And it really came forward with um, when we were trying to do the data analysis because um, if you're having a collaborative process, then data analysis would have to be collaborative too, right? And, but yet, the, anyone use NVivo in the room? Like just, okay, so you know, you got qualitative data analysis. You have like oodles and oodles and oodles of just transcripts, right? So number one, we had like 10 students transcribing all of these things. Mm -hmm. So that was just like a lot of work. 
um, if you transcribe things, then you're reading it as you go. It kind of gives you a, a closer connection to what you're engaged with with your data, right? Um, so that meant that the collective members were not those who were transcribing it. And so though, although most of us had been to lots of the different circles, we weren't at all of them, so we didn't hear all the stories. And they were over a period of four years, so we couldn't also, also remember everything. You had to go back to the transcript. And so that was just a, a logistical challenge, right? It's like, it's how do you have a collaborative process of figuring out what's meaningful and what does it all mean? And honestly, I think that we did some, and we didn't do as much as we could have. Um, um, you know, um, uh, as I mentioned, the student, we had a number of different student interns. The student intern put together some of the key things and um, diff pulled out different quotes, and we had a conversation where we sort of talked about what some of that meant, and, and we also had you know, pieces that we were writing and then looking and sharing on Google Drive. Mm -hmm. But realistically, I would say that um, myself, Dantia, who was one of the people who was kind of more involved in the writing piece, like some of us were more involved in the writing pieces and others were not. And so, I don't know, I would love to hear from Helen and Linda what you think about like um, coming up with what's meaningful and what um, what we need to do about it. Like how do you feel like, we'll, how collective were we on that? And I, I, think we, I think we work collective on it, but I think everybody has their own little pet project that they want mm -hmm. to be highlighted you know, mm -hmm. more than more than maybe another one. So I think there might have been some of that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, if, if you want to, if you think that there's too many C-sections being done, then right. that's what you want to have highlighted, and talk right. about, and change. Um, and somebody else might have some other you know, thing. Right. I think it has a lot to do with what your own personal biases. Right, it's true, it's true, and what stands out in the text kind of really also connects to what issues you've been working on. And so to a certain extent, having more people doing that means that you have more of those different lenses in there. Uh, but I would definitely say that it's a process that we haven't perfected, um, but, I'm, uh, but it was definitely way different from when I just was doing research as, you know, as an activist scholar, but then I would just do all the data analysis myself. So that was really different. And the second one, see, this two-part questions. I never like two-part questions because uh, I forget the second one. Um, the second one was about... Um, how can you... Um, oh, empowering communities yeah. too. Right, right. Yeah, understand themselves as researchers and producers of knowledge production. So, you know, I'm still kind of, I think the, the votes are still out as to whether communities need to understand themselves as researchers in order to do research. Mm -hmm. Right. Because clearly, not necessarily, right? I did um, it. I was a researcher. Right, the whole time, right? You know? <laughs> so I think the question might still be, uh, instead, be how could we um, have conversations about a toolkit that comes out of research, right, right? as something that could be useful to for furthering community agendas. And I think if we just turn it around that way, then there are multiple tools yeah. that we have in communities. I think what helps, that's really helpful, because then instead of it being, well, here's the researcher who's coming in with all this yeah. expertise to share, it becomes, you know, we all have different things. So like I was saying, when we were doing the kicks, the book, you know, it was really important that I knew how to, how to edit, because I'd edited a number of books. That was a really important skill. It's an academic skill. It was equally important that Helen had a crew of folks who knew how to make a Kickstarter video, mm -hmm. because without that, it was, wasn't going to be funded. <laughs> so that also seems to me that, that there's a piece there about different types of knowledge that you have collaborating. I'm coming back to you, because sure. everyone else Chris. So uh, I teach the undergrad and graduate level that class in ethnic studies. Awesome. Um, one of the questions I think especially the grad students going to have is, um, they oftentimes want to inspire by this type of work, they want to do collaborative research, mm -hmm. um, but then comes a very practical issue like, will you get a job? Okay. So they want to be academics. Is this the type of research you could only do after 10 years? Is this the type of research you could only do if you're part of a community organization? Because there's no real jobs out there. We want to hire a research justice specialist. We want to hire someone who situates their work in what the people they're working with say, not, not in yet. an academic literature. Not yet. Not yet. So yeah, they're not getting the value. So how do we deal with some of these? Like, well, I, I, I do think that um, a lot of it is about framing, and a lot of it is about, you no, know, of course, we have to create the jobs that we want. And what we do is that the way we do that is that we get the job, and then we turn it into the job that we want it to be. I mean, I've mm -hmm. always done that. Nobody's ever said to me, come in here and do activist scholarship or come in here do research justice or yeah. that's never happened right and 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 this is not something research justice is a framework I wasn't aware of it in terms of the language and the framing before I had tenure but I was definitely absolutely all about doing activist scholarship before that um, and that wasn't what I was hired for although in ethnic studies it's not necessarily frowned on right yeah. so it's a little easier than in, in a traditional sociology department um, I think that uh, there's different ways that we talk about our work 
And so this work, I could talk about it in terms of research justice. I could turn that around and talk about it in terms of uh, health disparities and you know, racial equity and ways in which it's completely, you know, can be interpreted and understood by mainstream scholars. In fact, to the extent that um, you know, Christine, who comes out of a very Christine Morton, who you know wrote the foreword, I'm sure would have brought it with me because she wrote, she basically said that um, we've been funding millions of dollars into doing all this research and we haven't figured out the answer. And what we realize now is that we needed more of what this research is, right? So, so actually, I, I, I think that. Um, I actually think that the self-censorship and the fear is greater than the barrier mm -hmm. and the obstacles. Because I don't know, for whatever reason, because I came out of a nonprofit sector before academia, I always felt like, well, I've got another job I could go back to. Not that I want to, because I love what I do, but I always kind of had this sense that if I'm not going to do it the way that it needs to be done, why am I here? Mm -hmm. And I think that if you start with that intention, um, um, you, you, of course, you can't spend five years trying to develop a research project and not publish anything and then th think you're going to get tenure in a year. Like, that's not realistic. So we also have to have pragmatism, but can you write along the way about what your research you're doing and get that published as part of it? So I do think that, yes, there are the expectations of tenure and so on, but I don't think that that has to um, undermine the work that we do here. Mm -hmm. right? And I also always said that if I'm going to wait, because people will say, wait till you get tenure, then you can do that. <laughs> well, come on now. Tenure is six years. Right? So, so if you haven't done it for six years, you're not going to suddenly turn around and figure out how to do something different. It's become ingrained. I mean, if you do something for six months, isn't it supposed to be great like smoking? If you don't smoke for six months, you don't need, uh, something like that. It's like, so, so I think that we need to just do it, right? And then find ways to articulate that. And I also think we'll find more allies in jobs, because here we are, right, who want to hire people who are doing this work than we might imagine as well. I wanted to also address um, her second question about people feeling like they're researchers. I think the thing that I'm finding out in my research education <laughs> is that people do this research and then the people they research never know what happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think if, if you can bring that back to them yeah. and say, remember when we were here and we were talking to you? Mm -hmm. This is what has come out of that. And this, what we've done with our circles is we're having a party in December mm -hmm. to bring the people who were in the circles in to see this research paper that we did that they were a part of. Mm -hmm. And so now they leave thinking, wow, you know, I'm a part of this change. Right. And we also invited them to submit photos so that all the photos in the report are going to be folks who, who and you know, it's well, it's kind of a weird thing because we don't not match in the name to the photo because they're all pseudonyms, but that if they wanted to contribute in different ways. So it's really kind of that community ownership as well. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Um, sorry, just to like stem from um, that second question. So we just addressed how um, to like empower communities to feel like researchers, but how can this knowledge be validated in like academia and higher education? Because it's not mm -hmm. until a researcher or a scholar comes into these communities to like somehow validate that mm -hmm. knowledge in academia. So is, the, is it possible like, you know, to not need that sense of validation from like Western academia or for it to be rendered as valid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first piece, let me just reframe. So instead of empowering communities, to do this research, let's empower ourselves mm. to be able to work in community. Mm. So let's just just turn the framing around. Mm. We, it's not our job to go and empower communities. Yeah. There's all kinds of power within communities. Yeah. But actually, I've been extremely empowered by doing this work, although mm. also challenged and made more accountable. So I think we turn it around, then we enter with more humility. Yeah. Then it's like, hey, I have a toolkit that I think might be cool yeah. to bring to your toolkit. What do you think? Mm. And it's a whole different thing. So that's just one piece. Yeah. But in terms of um, you know, kind of val validity, so we have to think about uh, for validity for what, right? right? Mm -hmm. So data center, for example, have done all kinds of community-based research projects that never had any validity, well, in other words, never had any kind of rubber stamping from any academic institution because they weren't about that. They were about, for example, they did this incredible study about, um, 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 gosh, I've just got blank. And it was domestic workers, and it was connection with a union, but I forgot the name of the union. Um, but And they were able to get some legislation as a result of that, because they did research that indicated the kind of horrible working conditions that um, domestics were working under. So that was enough. That, so I think that what's really important is to identify what um, what's our goals, what are we trying to achieve with this research. If what we're trying to do is that part of it is that we're trying to create some change in the community, and part of it is that I'm also a PhD student and I'm trying to get a PhD, mm -hmm. then you have to think about um, writing that up in such a way that you can get 
the recognition for that. But I also want to say that, you know, the t I didn't use research justice, the frame, when I did my PhD, but I did do my PhD in a really traditional sociology department in the UK, which is a pretty traditional place for sociology. Mm -hmm. And I was doing activist scholarship and I was writing about black feminist sociology. Mm -hmm. um, and hey, there's folks who had been before me and I could just cite them, you know? So I always think there's something about just where we're at, we're so blessed because we have so many folks who've gone before us. We build on that work and that is, in academic terms, that's where you get that validity, right? Is that you're actually kind of drawing on a framework that pre-existing, you didn't just create it out of the air. Um, and I always told my students that, yes, you have to give a lot more rationale as to why you're doing this when you're su submitting your ethics approval. Um, proposal, you're going to have to really explain what you're doing, where somebody who's using a very traditional positivist methodology just can write two lines, you know, and it's like, yeah. check, you know. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't get it approved, and they do get them approved, because they write a strong rationale but based on what's, you know, known to be kind of some methodologies out there that are legitimate. Not to say that everyone's going to love your work, but hey, we're not here to be loved, right? <laughs> we're here to get the work done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, join me in. Thank you. Thank you for having me.